Good morning, everybody. This is our session. We have a number of uh, good speech that uh, I'm not going to introduce myself, but <laughs> I'm going to introduce all of you. Uh, briefly, of course, because we don't want to take away too much time from the uh, program. And uh, let's just start at, uh, with an introduction which I'm going to talk to you about. It's mostly is these are, uh, it is impossible to introdu introduce uh, a, a, a drug delivery in, in general in this going to time. So I'm just going to flash up a few ideas and a few thoughts. First of all, is that our human body is a complex system with emergence between its subsystems. So what is the emergence mean? The emergence mean that the next level, from the next level, proper, the next properties of the next level cannot be deducted from the previous one completely. So we have a subcellular, a cellular, a tissues, organs, limbs, flow that keeps together, a nervous system that keeps us working, and it's a dynamic system when alive, and of course the static one is dead, when the flow will supply and information stops. We are part of this adaptive learning, that our body is uh, every level and every biological entity work together for the survival of the whole. Slightly different genes that we inherit and develop various skills by adaptive learning in different places to, to do or avoid actions that avoid certain conditions. And uh, during this time, we interact with the environment, which may or may not be ideal for the individual's life. Um, Time has a crucial effect on our body and grow up, then grow old. We have different physical skills and then we acquire different mental skills. We pass our improved genetic codes, hopefully improved, and social skills onto the next generation and has a different system in our body which can correct for the influence of the environment and adapt, which is crucial for survival within certain limitations and sometimes it needs help. Today, medicine is moving forward from general towards specific, from a, a rest restoring health to system-based, based on the patient, individual, or group of patients. And there are definitely certain issues, because we are not identical, issues that limit finding the right medicines. Think about the mice experiments. Even mice are not identical, that were genetically engineered. They are not exactly the same. Whenever you look at an in vitro uh, image of cells, the cells are not identical. So uh, there is always two groups for toxic and beneficial so-called medicine, patient group one that, that works. That's the one that is toxic but works. And the only patient group four that is not toxic and beneficial, uh, which is really uh, what we are aiming for. Uh, it, the example is, for example, the metastatic melanoma, which is effective with 10% of the patients, or the sarcoid, which is effective with 4% of the patients, but they're 100% effective for that. So it's a very important one to find. The trick is to apply the right medicine, the right dose at the right time to the right patient, and it's not always that simple as it requires complexity, the more complex is a construct, the more specific it can be. Molecular man, looking at the, you are looking at the molecular mechanism of cancer or engine website, and no way that one single tool, one single medicine can influence it to the, the, the right direction. So the multifunctionality and complexity is un, of medicines are unavoidable, and nanomedicine can have this necessary multiple functionality. Nano is now present in every aspect of our life. Of course, the challenge, what we all know, is that more disruptive a new science, technology or business, the harder its implementation because of lack of knowledge, we don't know everything, uh, trying to avoid risk, especially in business, and the very strong possessions of the competitor's financial interest, what exists presently. So just very briefly, properties of nanoscale objects are the function of composition, architecture, what is connected, what kind of for physical properties, soft, hard, chemical, surface state, activity, charge, and so on. 
And these properties are transitional between molecular and bulk, again, due to the emergence of cooperative behavior. Surface contribution is usually prominent, it's very important. And the, not to forget that the properties of also the function of their distribution, very simple uh, uh, investigations with simple studies, distribution are rarely shown, but we know that it's incredibly important, especially at the later stages. So nanodrug development takes time, you know, all, all of us know this uh, scheme. And, but if you look at the commercialization pattern, everything is, it took about 20 years to come, go to commercial after the discovery to the special product. It's like, works for biotech, internet, nanotech, and I didn't put, but the next is nanomed, which is started about 2000. Uh, and now we're 2022. Let me, uh, <clears throat> let me mention one of the early, uh, early, study, the early studies and an early uh, big names, the Ruth Duncan, who in 2003 already, did, when he, she wrote this, the dawning era of polymer therapeutics team, titled uh, review, it was already 40 nanomedicines in, in, in the clinical trials. These are very complex in vivo. They influence pH, interact with proteins, monocytes, may activate the immune system because it moves with the bloodstream and nano devices and deposits it onto into organs, dynamic equilibrium. Also interact with cells, bacteria in various ways, including surface receptors, nuclear receptors, may block, internalize, a lot of things can happen. And, but in general, they perform some kind of actions, release components, absorb, emit radiation, interact with the external field and so on, and then undergo breakdown and or expulsion and it's, it's excreted or not. The need to develop the other medicines further absolutely necessary, the new drugs and new delivery methods, and that's what we are talking to, I mean, rather I've been listening to you today. This is a systems approach, physiology-based pharmacokinetic approach, and so on, which I'm going to mention just briefly. One of them is a system approach, the network medicine. Human diseases are not in, independent of each other, and we learned it over the past two, three years very, very deeply that the social network, which encompasses all human human interactions, that play an important role in the spread of pathogens. There's a, there's a disease network, which is also connected if they have a common original functional origin, and then it's a metabolic network below that that if you once understand the functionality of the relevant interactions, that may lead to our better understanding. Here is the re recently updated network of disorders and disease genes linked by known gene associations. And we see that there are a big group of cancer and many of those things and the, why it is important, because connected knowledge, connected information is way more useful as a separate ones. Also, these nanodrugs have to be, uh, have to perform different uh, optimal uh, role that goes into circulation. It should be retented, but not too long. Uh, it's, uh, the surface should be stealthy or sticky, so it penetrates. The, it's a tumor example that accumulates and internalized and release the drugs and so on. All these uh, uh, are not very new. And what you are looking at at the moment, this is a mice. This is a mouse. It's a physiologically based pharmacokinetic model of a mouse and the tissue specific compartment where blood flows, you know, where we say, yeah, mouse, the mice were injected in the tailwind, and then we show a few very nice colorful pictures that here it is and there it is. But it was all just illustration. They have to actually calculate what is happening and how much time it is spent. The great thing is that the physiologically based models, if you know, we know how it works, it's translatable from rodents to humans. Uh, 
through an iterative the learn, confirm, and refine approach. And of course, mice are genetically engineered. They are very similar. Individual humans react in a certain way and healthy volunteers. And of course, uh, there is a always differs. It is always differs from the late development of patients. So in new medicine development, there is, and there are a lot of mountains to climb before you can reach the top. And we all know from all experience that the sky is not always clear. After this brief uh, introduction, let me take one minute to introduce our next speaker, Don. Uh, instead of reading all those things, let me stop sharing my... So, what can I say? <laughs> We've got together a long, long time ago, and uh, Don has a real long list of achievements. He is, uh, he has more than 155 patents, authored uh, almost 280 peer review publications, more than 50,000 citations, and uh, few people, one of the few people who has more than 100 as the age index. Of course, it all requires time. So it didn't start it when he was 25. But not much later, we, we met and uh, we had already uh, made a few uh, uh, appreciative thoughts to each other. But uh, let me just finish with his uh, introduction with the, that uh, he is one of the top 40 most cited scientists in the field of chemistry. And uh, at the time when dendrimers were discovered, everybody knew that it is not possible. Those structures do not exist. Don, it's yours. <laughs> the floor is yours. Thank you, Lou. Uh, are we on? Okay. Oh, we're about to share here. Okay. Are we sharing yet? We're in now? Yes. Good morning. Uh, uh, this is uh, Don Tamale coming to you from Mount Pleasant, Michigan, USA. And we are we will have to wait for another two or three hours before the Basel sunshine arrives here. But uh, in any case, in the interest of science, uh, I'm delighted to share this story with you this morning. And I want to thank the organizers for the kind invitation to uh, uh, reflect on some of the uh, uh, roles and some of the contributions that Denimers have made to nanomedicine. When you look at a uh, when you look at a title like this, you you could easily uh, present a one or two hour talk. And for that reason, uh, since we have only fifteen minutes, I want to apologize up front for not uh, being able to cover all of the major contributors and the major contributions that have occurred over the last forty years. Uh, of the history of dendrimers. And, uh, but instead, uh, we will, see, I need to advance to the, instead, we, uh, if we look at this outline, and it's not as complex as it may appear to be, it's, gonna, it's three parts. Uh, scientific overview, it will be uh, rapid. Uh, we'll cover four main topics, uh, to keep it simple. A uh, commercial overview, we'll cover, uh, roughly three or four companies to keep it simple. And then I would like to wrap up with a, a major new discovery uh, that's happened to us here in the Nanosynthons Laboratory in the last three years that could change the way we think about bioavailability and the solubilization of all APIs in the pharmaceutical industry. And then wrap up with a, a few comments on, on, on the future and, the, and, and our lessons learned. Scientific overview, uh, we could talk for an hour or two about all of the contributions that have been made here. Uh, this next slide shows them in kind of an eye chart. We won't 
concentrate on the early days, but let's concentrate on what's happened. As Lou indicated, the first decade, uh, people didn't believe in dentomers until mass spec came along and proved that, yeah, yes, indeed, they are precise macromolecular structures. And that is when everything exploded and make the story brief and succinct uh, in this last uh, recent uh, uh, search on Web of Science and Scopus, I've discovered we have over 90,000 literature and patent references in Scopus as of April uh, 26th this year. And that tells you a lot about what's going on. Uh, Denimer Field is really very active. Uh, now, just to stay within our time limits, I'd like to just focus on four simple topics shown here. Uh, which uh, will hopefully give you a feeling for some major contributions that Denimers have made uh, over the last four decades to nanomedicine. Uh, we all talk uh, very routinely about using receptor, active receptor targeted delivery of nanoparticles. Well, Don, excuse best? me, Donna. Excuse me, could you go on full screen presentation? Oh, I'm no. sorry. Oh, no, no problem. Sorry. Click. Clicking on yeah. it. Thank you, thank you. No, no problem. Thank you. Ah, is that better? Is that better? Okay. Am I mute? No. Okay. No. Can you see that now, Lou? Yeah. There's no voice. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, okay. So, so the. You can see it, but you have to click on the, the presentation slide. That is step is that four to the right in the bottom of your screen. Next to the 70%, do you see the bottom? We're, we're, we're missing something. Can you see uh, my slide? Uh, yes, we can see your slide, but it's not in presentation. Okay, may I go on? Okay. So, one of the first examples of an active receptor targeted nanoparticle was actually demonstrated in the Dow Laboratories back in the early 1990s. And uh, this slide here shows it was actually appeared in a patent reference. Um, uh, sorry, I can't get this stuff out of the way here. How do we get that out of the way? All right. That's no, okay. Keep going. Yeah. Keep all right. Going. All right. And in that, the, those examples appeared in in a patent that was uh, uh, published in back in the early 1990s. And it, it, it's technology that Star Pharma is currently using today to deliver radioactive nucleides for uh, diagnostic and for the uh, therapeutic treatment of cancer. And uh, it's referred to as their depth technology. And Marianne. Uh, Ashford from AstraZeneca, I'm sure, will tell us a lot more about that area. A, a second area uh, that I feel Dendemers have really uh, offered some major uh, uh, insights and contributions to the nanomedicine field is uh, the use of so-called critical nanoscale design parameter engineering, which involves the manipulation of size, shape, surface chemistry, flexibility, elemental compositions, and architecture. And, and Lou touched on that in a few of his slides, how important those parameters are. Because when one can control those parameters and manipulate them and optimize them, you have a perfect opportunity to decide and control excretion modes, nanotoxicology, pharmacokinetics, as well as biodistribution. And in a few more slides, I'll show you how we have a vivid example where we bioimage, do an in vivo bioimaging with uh, uh, fluorescent dendrobers to show a beautiful biodistribution that's a function of the surface chemistry on the surface of a dendrobe. Now, one of the revolutionary new development I was referring to uh, concerning the enhancement of uh, solubility parameters for APIs to increase bioavailability. Uh, involves also a certain aspect of CNDP engineering or critical nanoscale design parameter engineering, and it involved learning how to mix architectures 
to get a very universal excipient that we refer to as superplex, which is a dendritic linear branched uh, mixed architecture compositions that are absolutely astounding when they you understand how versatile they are in enhancing the solubility of a vast range of important APIs. That, and they are based on some very nice green sustainable raw material shown here. We'll talk about that later. Now, coming to this uh, uh, demonstration of CMDP engineering uh, with Dendermers, uh, in the last decade, we have Don, done... Uh, Don, I'm, I'm sorry, you're still on slide five. Is that correct? I'm on slide five, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Are we all right? Yeah, I'm going, I'm gonna go fast. Uh, this last, this, this, this area uh, in, on this slide is ref that we refer to as NTI, NTIL or as the rest of the world is now calling it cluster of luminescence involves a, an intrinsic property that Pam and Dendemers have exhibited over the last 30 or 40 years. And we just now in the last decade figured out what it's all about. And we wrote about it in, in a very comprehensive review shown here. The bottom line is if you irradiate a PAM dendimer at 335 nanometers, it will relax and fluoresce around 450 nanometers because of the so-called cluster luminescence phenomenon and it involves architecture confining uh, electron-rich surface chemistry groups on the surface of the dendimer. We will show you how we use that in the, in the CMBP engineering event uh, with uh, a perkin elmer in vivo imaging uh, instrument in a couple of more slides. In fact, that instrument is in this next slide. And uh, Dr. Pra uh, Mayank Singh, uh, as part of his PhD thesis and his work here at Nanosynthons, has shown that this perkin elmer optical imaging instrument is now has the sensitivity that we could never uh, uh, obtain or observe with old confocal instruments. And some of the interesting in vivo imaging, in fact, these are first of a kind, have involved, in this case, the oral uh, administration of these dendimers shown here, amine, terminated carboxy. Don, Don, you are still on the number slide, number five slide. Please. It's not ad moving? Advance the slide, no, it doesn't. We don't understand this. It's, it's a shame. Can you see that one? Um, see, it, it, it's an uh, it's a it's a, an in vivo imaging slide. No, well, we see the first published example. We, that's One a, of these slides are coming through. That's a shame. Um, no. These are beautiful slides. It's a it's a shame because these are beautiful slides, and I. <sighs> I don't know the problem. Should be on your side. Sorry. Why don't know? Now? Yeah. Yeah, please. please. Now? Yeah. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Maybe we'll be eye imaging. Yes. Thank okay. You. Okay. I'm sorry about the. Here's the cluster luminescent pan and denimers. Here is the instrument that Dr. Singh uses to image, and here are the images for oral administrated, uh, administered uh, PAMAM denimers, amine, carboxy, hydroxy, and pyrrolidone terminated. Uh, Dr. Trophopoulos uh, Panos will talk about pyrrolidone denimers, I think, in his talk coming up next. Now, interesting to see, we can observe beautiful biodistributions that are a function of the surface chemistry of the dendimer, which I have the exact same sizes, essentially, generation four. So here's CMDP engineering in practice. You can see the difference in biodistribution just as a function of the surface chemistry of the dendimer, shown here. That is beautiful. This is the first time ever we have been able to in vivo image with, using NTIL or cluster luminescence, as shown in this slide. And here, this is a second slide of, showing you intravenous in administration where you can see a, blood, a passage of the blood brain barrier here with some uh, uh, fluorescence here as well as in the kidney liver area. Now, 
Uh, that covers the four topics quickly. The, uh, unfortunately, you didn't see the other earlier slides because of our technical problem here. But now let's go to the commercial overview. We're going to cover four companies very quickly uh, that have had an impact in the Denver field. The most recent, well, there are many things that went on in the history of Denver's that we won't have time to go into, but in the debate in the room, maybe we can talk about them if there are questions. One of the most recent and exciting events is that a new company in Stockholm, Sweden went IPO. It was completed successfully called Polymer Factory of Stockholm, Sweden. And that is run by Mike Malcock uh, and uh, Anders Hall and others. But uh, the real success story is the Star Pharma story, which Mary Ann Ashford will tell us about here shortly in which uh, Star Pharma is now, after 10 years of operation, of uh, approximately a half a billion dollar company. Uh, just in the last couple of years, they have sold one of the patents that we passed on to them a few years ago for $35 million, uh, where a, a prior star Denimer family was used as an excipient for delivering ag chemicals. And I'm sure Mary Ann Ashford will tell you more uh, exciting um, uh, updates on other Star Pharma families shown below here. A second company is Teva Biotech, which uh, we'll talk about. It's a Bob Langer company. And then the third is Nanothensentons and our Superplex development in the last three years. The uh, Star Pharma uh, products fall into two major categories. Those that involve drug delivery with Dendemers and those wherein the Dendemer is actually an intrinsically active drug, it's shown here. Uh, most of the activities of Star Pharma are based on 229 patents that were transferred from Dow to Mali to Star Pharma in 2006 when the Star Pharma took over our portfolios. And uh, you can look them up, their most recent activities. They presented a, a, a major uh, developments at a Boston conference just within the last week or two. And if you look into that website shown below, uh, the Third company that I would like to bring to your attention that is really making some ways is Teva Biotech. It's based on uh, uh, Bob Langer technology from MIT. And although they were a year behind Moderna, they have successfully uh, created vaccines based on dendemers for the treatment of COVID and all of these viruses showing here. This technology is based on earlier work by uh, Bert Sheck, Ling Peng, and Bob Langer, uh, that you can see at the bottom of this slide. Uh, this is truly uh, an area that, uh, as we've heard yesterday and many of the other beautiful talks on a message or RNA, this shows you where Dendemers will make a contribution in these uh, RNA vaccine uh, development uh, issues. Uh, now, the, the fourth area is an area that I'm pretty excited about. Two minutes, uh, two yes. more minutes. Thank yep, you. we're just about done. Uh, enhancing the bioavailability of APIs, and we have developed a material that uh, solves some very important unmet needs shown here. 40% of all FDA approved pharmaceuticals are insoluble, 90% uh, in the pipeline are insoluble, and these are the benefits one might get by enhancing solubility. The technology involved involves these three grass listed raw materials, a simple one pot synthesis to make these shiny white non toxic materials. This is the only dendrobar in my entire career that I have actually eaten and tasted in the laboratory. I'm so confident about its safety and its lack of toxicity. And you'll hear more about that later. What does it do? It can enhance the solubilities of a wide range. I've just got a small sampling of nutraceuticals, vitamins, flavonoids, and the inflammatories shown here. And we currently have, in fact, based on this information, an IND preclinical stage activity going with Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. And this next slide, I would like to uh, wrap up by saying, uh, although it seems like Denimers have been slow uh, in their development of uh, progress, but compared to uh, listening to Chessie Bernholtz in the last two days, he went to a similar journey, which took him 34 years for his liposomes to make it from discovery to first approvals. Then the numbers are right around 32 years, within a couple of years. As Lou mentioned, it takes 30 years to get to that torturous path for approval. 
I'd like to wrap up by acknowledging uh, the Dr. Singh, Shah, uh, Pro Professor Shahan, uh, Abhi Shahan, and my Nana Sinton staff, as well as Barbara Kleiner, Yarn Christensen, and Redemian, who funded part of this work. And I'd just like to wrap up saying we are here in uh, Mount Pleasant, Michigan, waiting for the Basel Sun to arrive. And I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Don. Please stop sharing. Why would you do that? Yeah. Yep. Just close the presentation. Yeah. Uh, let me introduce the, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Pan, Panagiotis Stokopoulos. That's a common name, Panas, that we had to simplify your name. <laughs> for all cleanup users, we are very know each other for a very long time. He is a medical doctor, a distinction of excellence from uh, the Aristotle uh, University of Thessaloniki, Greece. And uh, he is a <coughs> cardiologist uh, who uh, established, who started Cosmophos Limited with the uh, uh, in general, borderline medical products and all kinds of clinic development and clinical trials or nanotechnology based, early development, anything which is related to carbos. Instead of uh, giving over more of your uh, history, go ahead, please share your screen and start your presentation. Thank you. Is it okay? Yep. Okay, so Lou, thank you very much, first of all, for the nice introduction. And uh, and I would like also to thank uh, uh, Bert uh, and also Patrick for the very kind invitation uh, to give me this um, opportunity to talk into this uh, prestigious conference. And thank you very much, uh, Lou, for the very nice words. So I'm planning to talk uh, my, uh, for Dendermers uh, uh, how we are going from innate immunity to cardiology, cardiovascular medicine, but also beyond these diseases. And also, uh, I will present first time in the literature the so-called ASA phenomenon. I will explain you more later. So this is the general structure of a Dendermer, as you very well know, in a 2D conformation, because Dendermers are 3D structures. And uh, as you can see here, uh, there are um, different generations. Um, I'm just depicting here some of them. Um, from G2 to G5, the most of the applications are uh, using uh, dendermers between G3 and G5 generations. And uh, with different uh, functionalities, as you can see here, I'm just putting the three that we have worked on. The amine terminated dendermers, pyrolidon terminated, and carboxy trees. Trees means uh, with trees, uh, uh, three hydroxyl groups. And, uh, and I'm going now uh, to present directly what is this ASA phenomenon. So this ASA phenomenon, uh, as, you, as you understand, they are uh, nanostructures, synthetic nanostructures that uh, they have uh, uh, displayed surface motifs that are very tightly packed in the surface. It's uh, actually less than one nanometer. Uh, and this Angstrom scale spacing arrangement, this is what uh, ASA means uh, of these N-terminal motifs, um, gives the ability to the dendermers to escape sensing by the human pattern recognition molecules of the complement system. Because these molecules recognize structures uh, and uh, which are N motifs that are between two and 15 nanometers. So here we are talking for less than one. And by doing this, dendermers escape complement recognition, and for this reason, they do not activate the human complement system. So this is just a metaphoric uh, 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 photo. This is a very nice plant just outside my home. Imagine, for example, these are a, a dendrimer structure with a very tightly packed surface. And the B in this case, it is uh, uh, the pattern recognition molecules that is puzzled how, what is this stuff cannot recognize. So, but always there is a surprise. Uh, all, the type, all the endermer types that we use, as I said before, I mean terminated, pyrolidol and terminated carboxy trees, 
no, no of these dendromeres are directly trigger complement activation through any of the known pathways of the, of the complement activation classical, lectin, or alternative. And this is due to this ASA phenomenon. But the surprise is that the amine terminated endomers, even if they do not directly activate the complement due to this uh, ASA phenomenon, still in the human plasma and in the presence of, uh, of a, a subset of uh, immunoglobulin M glycoform, which is around 25% of the total immunoglobulins, uh, making uh, alterations in, uh, uh, of this structure, of these IgM glycoforms, causing the IgM to trigger, finally, the activation of the lectin pathway. And for this reason, we focus on the most benign of them, which is the pyrolidon terminated and the carboxy tris terminated dendromers, as Don said before, I will focus on this. So this is our proposed scheme, and this is published very lately in Nature Communications uh, in 2021, August. And also, actually, it was uh, published uh, in Nature Portfolio Health Community, uh, which is uh, um, only, only the three top percent of all journals published in Nature, 62 Nature journals uh, uh, invited to publish in the portfolio. So the people in Nature understood what is the big importance of this uh, discovery. Um, so in this scheme, I will try to make it simple for you. On the left side, you can see in the white color, these are the pyrolidon uh, terminated endomers. On the right side, this blue, uh, uh, the amine terminated endomers. So this structure is the IgM glycoform. We call it IgMB. And uh, you can see here that uh, the pyrolidon terminated endomers do not interact with uh, this IgMB. So finally, also due to ASA phenomenon, escape complement uh, sensing and activation. But on the right side, as you can see, this um, uh, amine terminated dendromers making conformational changes of this uh, uh, pentameric IgM, and then exposing sugars, and then uh, the manon uh, binding lectin, the MBL molecule, is uh, attached to this IgM and then cleaves the C4 to C2 and C3, and we have uh, activation of the complement system uh, through the lectin pathway. So for them, uh, for, for all of you that you would like to read more, this is the uh, paper, uh, in the Nature Communications, and also you can go to the blog, the Nature Health blog, which is also a very nice publication there. So, why now this is a, a, an important discovery anyway, and how this is connected with the atherosclerotic cardiovascular diseases? In order to understand, I would like to um, give you some brief introduction of uh, what is cardiovascular diseases. For some of you who knows, but uh, other probably don't know so much. So just brief uh, um, data from the epidemiology, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease are by far the leading cause of human death. And with nearly 18 million deaths every year, and this is from the WHO. So all types of cancer together, more than three or 400 types combined, uh, have a, a, a burden in the society, uh, killing 96.1 million deaths every year. So actually somebody has twice as much a possibility to die from a cardiovascular disease than from all cancer types together. So uh, this atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is a very large group of diseases and include, I'm just giving you some um, examples, the coronary artery disease. Coronary arteries are the arteries that feeding uh, blood with uh, uh, the heart muscle. So the coronary artery disease is leading to myocardial ischemia and angina. Of course, the acute coronary syndromes, the so-called heart attacks, or myocardial infarctions, and of course, sudden death. Carotid artery disease is the disease of the, your carotid arteries that supply blood with, uh, with the brain and, uh, and leading to strokes. Uh, peripheral artery disease, uh, which, going, uh, which uh, leading to ischemia of the limbs and gangrene many times, unfortunately. Renal artery disease uh, is the arteries uh, feeding the blood with uh, the kidneys, and, uh, and this disease leading to hypertension and renal failure, aortic disease uh, that uh, creates aneurysm formation or dissecting aneurysm formation, and of course, death in these cases, and other atherosclerotic cardiovascular diseases, like, for example, subclavian artery disease, mesenteric artery disease, it's a huge 
group of diseases. So I'm giving you some uh, information about uh, what is atherosclerotic plaque, because atherosclerotic plaque is the common uh, lesion uh, of all atherosclerotic cardiovascular diseases, and it is built up in the subendothelial area of the arterial wall and, com and contains cholesterol, cholesterol esters, triglycerides, phospholipids, other fats, uh, uh, cells like macrophages, foam cells, smooth muscle cells, T cells, collagen, elastin fibers, cal calcium deposits, and uh, of course extracellular matrix. So it's a, it's a complex, it's a complex uh, and, uh, and a structure, histopathological structure. There are basically two major categories of atherosclerotic plaques. One is the stable ones. We call them stable. Uh, they are leading only to progressive narrowing. And finally, uh, you have limited blood flow to organs and tissues, causing ischemia. Ischemia means reduced um, uh, blood flow to the organs. And we have, of course, the vulnerable, which are, we call them vulnerable. It's the unstable atherosclerotic plaques. And these uh, plaques are leading to rupture or erosion and subsequent acute thrombosis. And, and this is causing, finally, heart attacks and strokes and sudden death, as you can see later on. So this is just an illustration of this type of uh, atherosclerotic plaques. On the left side, you can see the so-called stable. Um, and then on the right side is the unstable plaque. Look, for example, the stable plaques, are the most of them are stenotic, but these plaques are not killing you. Uh, they have a very thick fiber cap, uh, very low or no inflammation inside. It's just uh, an obstruction that uh, medical doctors can uh, remove, for example, through a balloon geoplasty. But these are the kind of plaques that are killing people. This, they, these plaques, they have a, a very uh, thin fiber cap, as you can see here. It is a, a big inflammatory degree inside the plaques. A necrotic or inside, a microvasculature developing as in all chronic diseases, and it's non obstructive, as you can see. This is the lumen. So, this is the real life. This is cross sections. Uh, on the left side, you can see the stable atherosclerotic plaque, the right side, the vulnerable one. You can see here the so called thick cap fibroatheroma, thick. But on the left side, you see this thick fat, the thin cap fibroatheroma. These are the kind of plaques that are killing the people, you know, because these plaques, they have a very thin uh, uh, fibrous cap, which is ruptured, and then the thrombus is closing the vessel without causing before any other prior, prior symptom. So this vulnerable plaque concept has been first conceived by the Greek professor of medicine, the University of British Columbia, Dr. Paris Konstantinidis, and I pay a tribute uh, to Paris, uh, coming from, from Greece, and uh, his, uh, he published this in 1964, as you can see on the, on the bottom right. Uh, and this, um, he was talking, he was um, a professor of microanatomy in the University of British Columbia. You can see him here in the first transmission electron microscope, 1950. So he became professor when he was 31 years old. Hey, and, Paris, uh, you have two more minutes. Okay. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then this is uh, the picture of, uh, of uh, Paris Constantinidis. Okay. So the vulnerable atherosclerotic plaques are, the, uh, they are less than 50% stenosis. Here you can see different types of vulnerable plaques. And this is the vast majority of them, which are non-occlusive non plaques. And here is big, um, what is the severity of atherosclerotic plaques before? Uh, uh, before the myocardial infarction. So you can see 50% 50 50 and less, it causes 70% of infarctions. So you can see here, for example, plaques, this is the normal on the left side coronary artery, this is the right. You can see the plaque here, which is non-obstructive. Here are other modalities. You can see the very thin fibrous cap. And what is the unmet medical need that, uh, uh, Many nanomedicines today, when it accumulates in the disease sites, they, uh, they have uh, they trigger complement activation, and this is promoting inflammatory cascades. So for this reason, if we use this kind of particles in atherosclerotic disease, we will increase the atherosclerotic plaque burden, and this is very pro-inflammatory and pro-thrombotic, and finally, you will kill your patient instead of treating your patient. So the Cosmo 4 system uh, that we have developed, which I have designed, 
uh, many years ago uh, is a disruptive nanotechnology dendrimer enabled system for the early diagnosis, therapy, and therapy monitoring of uh, cardiovascular diseases and has been partially funded by the European Union in the Cosmophos Nano Project. And uh, we are using the, uh, the dendrimeric nanomedicines, the Cosmophos dendrimeric nanomedicines that are complement safe. This is just a transmission electron microscopy. And, uh, and this system, Cosmophos system, is using the Cosmophos dendrimeric nanomedicines, which is a component of it. And the system stabilizes and passivates the vulnerable atherosclerotic plaques, preventing rupture and thrombosis, and successfully applied already in rabbit models of atherosclerosis. Also, I'm sorry, you have to wrap up. Yes, uh, I will need only one, two minutes, uh, and I'm wrapping, Lou, uh, thank you. So we can use the system in other diseases where we have dysregulated complement activation, and uh, like cancer, for example, uh, autoimmune diseases, neurodegenerative infectious diseases. And my final two or three slides is this, uh, that uh, we can use this to coat stents, avoid complement activation, inflammation, risk, and ocean thrombosis, also membranes. And uh, of course, we can use them in the drug delivery using this as a phenomenon, coating of, of other nanoparticles. And this is very important, the number five, that we can uh, stabilize nanomedicines and nanotechnology-enabled vaccines with uh, the dendrimerylation or denylation instead of pegylation. And also we can use them for modulating the actions of the cytokine responses intracellularly. Finally, this is my final slide. Uh, the ASA phenomenon in medical microbiology, uh, many uh, 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 virulent pathogens, uh, uh, viruses, microbes can use this ASA phenomenon. So this knowledge could help microbiologists and researchers to develop uh, novel antibacterial, antifungal, antiparasitic, and antiviral medicines. And by doing this, I would like to acknowledge gratefully the European Union for funding the Cosmo, this work uh, uh, through the Cosmo Fosmano project, especially to Professor Moin Mogimi for all these years of his support and kindness. Thank you, Moin, and uh, uh, also all of them who have contributed to this work. And this is a nice picture from Greece that I invite you to visit this summertime. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. And our next speaker is Dr. Professor Dr. Greg Foreman from the Helmut Center for Infection Research. And he will discuss challenges associated with extraterrestrial vehicles with antimicrobial drugs. Greg, please go ahead. We see your is by Canteria. There you go. Now you should be able to see yes. and hear me. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Thanks yes, also to the, to the organizers for the opportunity to present today. Um, so I'm working at the Friedrich Alexander University in Erlangen, and previously I was at the Helmholtz Institute for Pharmaceutical Research in Saarbrücken, which is why I'm still carrying both of these affiliations. And I would like to um, shift gear a little bit and talk about um, biogenic avenues, so-called cell-derived vesicles that we are trying to develop as carrier systems for antibiotics. So um, we're working a lot with, with so-called extracellular vesicles because they are one way of how um, cells are communicating. Basically, if you think about how this, this can take place, there could be two cells that are adhesion, adhesion um, ad adjacent to each other. They can exchange certain information. And it could also be that cells are releasing some soluble factors, which are small molecules, for example, that lead to a um, phenotypical change in the, in the target cell and, and that takes up those soluble factors. And the third avenue has just um, recognized in the past, let's say, decade a bit more. And this is communication through so-called extracellular vesicles. Now, these particles are um, basically nanoparticles that are produced by almost all cells that we know. For, they are very ubiquitous throughout all kingdoms of life. We find them in mammalian cells. We find them in bacteria, also in fungi, for example. They're composed of a, a phospholipid bilayer membrane. They're also decorated with some um, specific surface and membrane proteins. And they can also carry um, a certain information, which in this scheme, could be a protein, but also a nucleic acid. So the idea is that this 
cargo is really protected within the within the particles because they resemble some um, some similarities to liposomes. And then these vesicles, they um, induce a communication between different types of cells and different types of tissues. So how do we think that this works? Um, there is a mother cell that is producing these particles, and then they can induce some information exchange in, in, in the proximal area or in proximity to different cells, but also over longer distances. And we also know that these vesicles are present in almost any body fluid, could be blood, urine, breast milk, and so on. So for us, um, it is interesting to um, study the biological function of these, of these particles, especially their biological role during um, inflammatory processes, but also during infection. So we want to see how they are interacting with immune cells, for example. But of course, we're also interested in developing them in, um, as drug carriers, and we're interested in comparing um, unfunctionalized native EVs that are just isolated from cells compared to those that are additionally functionalized on the surface. We want to see how good is the interaction with target cell and can the vesicles be used as vehicles for drugs um, and also for the development of new diagnostic tools. So the way it works for us is that we are culturing different types of cells um, just in vitro in, in, in cell culture dishes, and then we isolate um, we isolate the vesicles through different um, filtration and centrifugation steps, which at the end are followed by a pelleting in an ultra centrifuge, and then we do some um, purification of these particles using size exclusion chromatography to get rid of protein aggregates, for example. And after after that, we are characterizing those particles um, physical chemically. So either in terms of protein content, but also in terms of um, size and size distribution and in terms of yield. And we're all the time also take some um, electron microscopy images to really confirm the, the shape and that they are intact and that we are actually dealing with um, extracellular vesicles. So these are some older examples of mammalian cells that we've used with, that we've worked with in the past. Now, I believe that it's, it's very well known also beyond the scientific community that there's an urgent need to develop new um, antimicrobial strategy, particular antibiotic strategy. And I think there's going to be an, an interesting afternoon session here at Cleanum as well. Um, there's an increasing number of resistant bacteria that are developing in the, in the past decades. This is a, a result of, of different factors. And it could be, on one hand, poor compliance or compliance issues in the clinics, but also contamination um, with antibiotics from livestock farming or through sewage and water supply, which overall then come back to us um, as people, as patients. And the bacteria have learned to deal with these um, antibiotics. At the same time, there's a decreasing number of new antibiotics that are developed from the pharmaceutical um, industry. And so we are trying to address one of these issues, which is the issue of lack of new antibiotics, or in our case, more lack of new antibiotic strategies. And so to do this, um, we followed a, a rather unusual approach because um, we were looking into bacteria-derived vesicles. So I've mentioned at the beginning that also bacteria are producing these particles, both gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. And some of these bacteria, especially the, the pathogenic ones, they use them as a, as a resistance mechanism to transfer some virulence factors. They also use them as a, as a defense mechanism, or they use them to modulate and um, host immune cells so that the for the propagation of the of the infection itself. And now, of course, it's not possible to use pathogen-derived vesicles in, in therapy and in, in treatment of patients which is why we established a very fruitful collaboration which, um, with Rolf Müller at, at the Helmholtz Institute in Saarbrücken. So Rolf and his team, they have a, they have a huge library of um, non-pathogenic soil living um, bacteria that are called mixobacteria. It's a, it's a large group of bacteria. And these mixobacteria, they have a few interesting properties. As you can see here, they not only produce these um, architecturally interesting fruiting bodies. They're also very colorful in colony, and they are very potent producers of new and um, natural products, for example, antimicrobial products. And what these mixobacteria are also doing is they show a, a multicellular swarming behavior. 
So this is shown here on these, on these pictures of agar plates. On the left, this is a drop of mixobacteria. On the right, this is a drop of E. coli. And you see that the 24 hours, the mixobacteria, they, they swarm out. They attack this an E. coli colony, which is then, after 48 hours, completely eaten up, completely disappeared. And so for us, it was interesting to understand what's the role of the mixobacterial vesicles in this process. We're trying to evaluate them in, in, in different models, including very simple planktonic bacteria, but also more advanced biofilm models, and would like to sh share some of our results with you today. So this is a work that has been um, led by my former PhD student, Eileen. And what she did is she isolated um, vesicles from different types of mixobacteria. You see them here. They're called CBV34 and SBSR073. Um, it's not so important now what, what strains these are. But what Eileen could show is that she can, she can isolate them. She has a good yield. She could also measure the size distribution of these particles. And she characterized them um, using cryo-electron microscopy to really confirm the presence of um, extracellular vesicles. Then what she also did is she um, comprehensively or in high detail, she assessed potential biocompatibility of these particles, both in vitro and in vivo. Of course, if we want to use them for, um, for drug therapy, we need to know whether they can stimulate an immune response or not. This is an in vitro model where she isolated peripheral mononuclear blood cells and incubated them with vesicles from different mixobacteria. And you see that there's a mild to moderate response or release of, of inflammatory markers here. She also carried this forward and assessed um, these particles in a zebrafish larvae model, where she looked at the development of heart edema, which is a, a known, um, a known um, development that these, or a known sign of, of biocompatibility for these, for these zebrafish larvae. And she could show that compared to a control, this is a ciprofloxacin, a known antibiotic that has a certain problem, certain problems with, with side effects, which induce rather high um, incidences of heart edema. We see a low number of incidences with our uh, mixobacterial vesicles. So of course, the biocompatibility looks promising, but of course, the immunogenicity always needs consideration. So what we are currently trying is we are rather would like to develop them for a local application first to learn for a potential systemic administration. So what Eileen also saw, and that was a bit of a surprise, is that um, when she incubated these vesicles with um, E. coli model bacteria, gram-negative model bacteria, that are stained in blue here, the vesicles are stained in yellow, we see a very nice um, co-localization here after 24 hours. And this co-localization led to an unexpected um, inherent antimicrobial effect. So the more vesicles we incubate with the E. coli, the quicker the bacteria died. And this was something we didn't expect because initially we wanted to load them with antimicrobial compounds. It turned out that the bacteria are doing already that job and they are loading the um, vesicles with this natural product. It's, a, it's called a cystobactamid. It's not a new natural product, but relatively recently discovered and it's currently under preclinical evaluation. It shows very good activity, especially against um, gram-negative problem pathogens. And it also shows little overlap with known um, clinical antibiotic with, with their resistance genes. So it's an interesting candidate to develop further. And what I would like to show you at the end is that we are also um, evaluated these vesicles and evaluated the interaction um, with bacterial biofilms. Now, bacterial biofilms are also a very well-known um, marker for development of resistance because it's a, it's a rigid diffusion barrier that bacteria embed themselves in, and it protects them from um, environmental influences. It also protects them from antibiotic drugs. So we were interested to see whether our vesicles can influence the architecture um, of biofilms and whether they can also induce bacterial killing. And this is work from my um, former PhD student, Adrieli, who together with the group of Knut Drescher from Basel could show that in a um, fluid model of biofilm, we have a substantial inhibition of the biofilm formation with our vesicles. Now on top here, this is the control, just the biofilm that is growing in the um, under flow conditions. And we see, a, we see a complete inhibition with two types of our mixobacterial vesicles. And this is not just an effect that is 
because there is <laughs> particle presence. When we look at, at control liposomes made from bacterial lipids, we don't see the same either. Greg, you have two minutes. Thank you. Rather interesting, and we're now trying to and um, carrying this forward to an, an further in vivo evaluations. So with this, I'm at the end. I would like to um, acknowledge my collaboration partners and, of course, the financial support. And um, here at the bottom, this is a picture of my previous group in Saarbrücken. This is my new group here in, at the Friedrich Alexander Universität in Erlangen. And with this, I'm at the end, and um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, we have to delay the questions uh, until we go to the discussion room, but uh, there will be a number of questions, I'm sure. <laughs> Our next speaker is Dr. Stephanie Schubert, uh, who is going to talk us for amphiphilical polypeptide for gene transfection. Stephanie, please take a minute away. see your yeah, presentation i hope so yes we see it and we hear you very well thank, thank you. you very much go ahead so thank you very much for the opportunity to to talk to you within this audience here and i have to apologize that i'm not uh giving a lecture about dendrimers although i did a postdoc with jean frichet who was also <laughs> a big player uh in the dendrimer field but i want to give you some yeah, some of my new results um, on uh, polypeptides that I did at the Friedrich Schiller University here in Jena within the Collaborative Research Center. And this is in collaboration with Sébastien Le Commandou from University of Bordeaux. So I guess we all know that um, polymeric nanoparticles have very beneficial properties because in contrast to very common uh, tablet formulations that can be administered to humans. Um, these polymeric nanoparticles can encapsulate the drugs, they can protect it during the ray to the target tissue, um, which leads then in the, uh, in, in the end to less side effects. And of course, we can also control the delivery and the, uh, the outcome of these drugs out of the nanoparticles by different degradation profiles of the polymers. And we can also um, control somehow um, their release out of the body, so the body clearance. And I want to highlight today the use of polypeptides as somehow natural building blocks. These polypeptides are uh, based on a, yeah, polyamide structure. They can be produced by ring opening um, polymerization also in large scale production, which is then also important if we want to talk about gene beat production later. And uh, these polypeptides have very uh, uh, huge structural varieties because you can use in principle every amino acid that you can imagine. And then also later after synthesis, um, structural variances can occur because of the secondary structures that occur. And um, yeah, coming from random coal formations to alpha helical or beta um, sheet structures, this can influence then very much uh, the interaction of cells, cellular membranes, for example. Because we are designing polypeptides now for gene delivery, I want to highlight a bit why we use our building blocks uh, that I introduced you later. So first, we need a cationic functionality on the polypeptides because we want to have an interaction of the negatively charged genes with the polymer itself in order to form polyplexes and to encapsulate somehow the genetic material. Then we have to design the polypeptides in a way that they are also taken up by the cell. And it is known that alpha helical structures, for example, um, enhance the cellular uptake. Also, um, hydrophobic functionalities on polymers or nanoparticles enhance cellular uptake because they interact better with the cellular membrane. Once these nanoparticles they, that embed a genetic material are then taken up uh, by endocytosis and are released to 
cytosol, of course, the polymers have to degrade. And the best would then also be to be biodegradable, meaning that they are degraded by proteases that are existing in every cell line. And in the end, uh, the genetic material can act as it's supposed to be. Now I want to go to the synthesis part. So this is uh, these are the carboanhydrides that we are using, and uh, we vary only the side chains of these carboanhydrides. With uh, polyethylene glycol that is um, functionalized with an amino functionality, we can induce the polymerization and form a polyethylene glycol uh, block copolymer with the polypeptides with varying ratios of the um, cationic functionality, here the amines, or the benzyl glutamate as a hydrophobic functionality. Finally, we have different, three different polymers in hand that are all well characterized, have low polydispersity indices, varying ratios of, in this case here, lysine functionalities, and the size exclusion chromatography also shows that these are very well-defined polymers. And when having a look on IR spectroscopy and circular dichroism spectroscopy, we can also see that uh, the secondary structures vary a lot within these three polymers. The higher the lysine content, the lower is the alpha helical structure. We now first have a look on the biocompatibility and the biodegradability. Sorry about it. biodegradability of the um, polymers itself. And we figured out that the first polymer with the highest lysine content was water-soluble, whereas the others were not. And it is not surprising that the water-soluble polymer, polymer one, is very toxic, even at very low concentrations, whereas the particles that are not soluble in water are non-toxic at all. However, we need um, soluble polymers in order to form nice polyplexes. Otherwise, the genetic material is only absorbed on the surface of the nanoparticles and not in the form as a polyplex itself. This is why we try to dissolve polymer two and uh, in acetate buffer. And then we see again the formation of um, that is uh, cytotoxic again. However, uh, because we are using polypeptides, we also try to cleave them, to degrade them. And in the end, it was possible by adding the trypsin as, an, as a protease uh, that the polypeptides that are in the beginning were very cytotoxic. After treatment with trypsin, they are not toxic at all. As a comparison to the generally used uh, linear polyethylene, that is somehow the gold standard for gene transfection, we also see that uh, the linear polyethylene imine is even toxic after trypsin treatment because it cannot be degraded at all. Then we had a look on the transfection efficiency. We see that um, only polymer one has a um, significant uh, transfection. So for transfection, GFP producing uh, uh, plasmid DNA was used and uh, added to the cell lines, L929 cells. And uh, only with polymer one, we can see any transfection. However, this uh, even polymer one, where we see something, an effect, uh, the uh, linear polyethylenamine that we use as a positive control has much higher transfection efficiency. And this is why we try to change our concept a little bit and we're using another system of uh, polypeptides. And therefore we used this uh, um, benzyl glutamate polypeptide as a structural basis. And this was then somehow deprotected in order to form the carboxylic Groups and this can then be uh, can then let be reacted uh, with hexyl amines or a diamino uh, butyl group that is also protected 
And uh, by using these post-polymerization reactions, it was comparatively easy to change the number of hydrophilic and hydrophobic side groups within the polymer and to adjust then, uh, the, the balance of the final polymer in order to have um, yeah, the best transaction efficiencies in the end. We again did a lot of structural investigation on these and um, the polydispersities look fine, size exclusion chromatography looks fine. And also then we could see that uh, there are different secondary structures as we aim to achieve with the highest amino content. Again, we saw more random call formation, whereas the higher the hydrophobic amount is, the more alpha helical structures could be achieved. When we had a look on the transfection efficiency, uh, we found out that the polymer number three here, an entropy ratio of uh, 10, shows an even better transfection efficiency than our positive control linear polyethylenamine. So accidentally, or not surprisingly, we found a um, sweet spot of cationic functionalities and hydrophobic side chains where the material is best taken up, but also released best out of the endosome and uh, going into the cytosol in order to uh, release the genetic material. We also had a, a look on the kinetics of these, um, of the performance of the polyplexus. And even after one hour, the transfection was the, the highest. Then we had a look on the interaction of the nanoparticles or the polyplexus with the cell itself. And we took uh, some transmission electron microscopy studies. And we can clearly see here, uh, these are the, yeah, the black dots. These are the polyplexus. Um, we can see that they are really taken up by the cells. They are in the endosomes. They interact with the membranes. And we can also see uptake events of the polyplexus itself. By using a fluorescence microscopy, we could we, we wanted to have a more, let's say, realistic look on the uptake behavior of these nanoparticles. Uh, the uh, uh, yellow, yeah, the light yellow colors here are the cell membranes that are stained with uh, cell mass deep red, and you know, the bluish light dots are the polyplexes. We took images then after 10 minutes after the administration of the polyplexus to the cells. And uh, also here in this image, you see that a lot of polyplexes are already attached to the cell membrane. And when we have a look now over time, we can see that there's a lot of action going on and I want to highlight some events of it. Uh, so usually all polyplexes when they are uh, attaching to the cell membrane, they membrane uh, they drift first on the membrane before they are taken up. Then the filipodia also take uh, take the polyplexus in order to um, yeah to guide them to the cell membrane. Then uh, sometimes also like you can see here, the filipodia they um, they catch from other cells polyplexus. So it's a real fight for polyplexus in the end. Philopodium surfing of the polyplexus is also a very common event that we could observe. And uh, we also checked how long it takes from a polyplex once it enters in a cell to be transported to the nucleus. And it is about a speed of four micrometer the minute. We also wanted to have a closer look on the three-dimensional space of the um, polyplex uptake into the non uh, into the cells. And uh, yes, Stephanie, two minutes. Thanks for the information. And um, here in this uh, yeah three-dimensional stack image, we uh, could observe that within one cell, uh, even seventy-seven. Polyplexes could be uh, 
uh, in cap or could be uh, taken up by one single cell. And with uh, these insights into the cell, I also want to finish my presentation. And um, I just want to highlight that we can also prepare the polypeptides uh, for uh, for other needs in order to uh, encapsulate other materials, not only genetic material, but of course, every new material needs new optimization of the material itself. Then also the formulation strategy is a big point uh, that we are also dealing with in order to formulate uh, optimized nanoparticles particles and uh, other work in our laboratories are going on with um, targeting functionalities that want to be attached to the nanoparticles in order to address uh, the nanoparticles directly to specific tissues. In the end, I want to thank all my collaboration partners, the Collaborative Research Center, Polytarget, DFG as a funding agency, and I want to thank you for your attention. Yes, Stephanie, thank you very much. It was very interesting. Uh, our last speaker is Navid Ahmad, yeah. who is going to talk to us to explain the okay. design of experiment, which is uh, a topic that less talked about, everybody's talking about, oh, we did this, we did that, but why did you design it that way? That's so much more rare. So, let yeah. me take away. Thank you. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes, we see your slide uh, and we hear your voice. Yeah. Thank you so much for your introduction. Uh, I'm Navid, a final year PhD student at King's College London, and I'm delighted to give the first oral talk of my PhD studies and clean them. Uh, the topic is exploiting design of experiment for development of polymeric nanoparticle for intranasal delivery of oxytocin for neurological disorder. As we know that oxytocin is a neuropeptide hormone mainly produced in the hypothalamus of the brain and released into the blood circulation through pituitary gland and produce various peripheral physiological actions, including uterine contraction during childbirth and lactation. Research has shown that uh, oxytocin also project to other parts of the brain and can regulate uh, various complex processes such as social, cognitive, and emotional behaviors. Uh, scientific evidence has shown that uh, central oxytocin deficiency is implicated in various uh, disorders, including autism spectrum disorders, anxiety disorder, and other neurodevelopmental uh, disorders. And uh, autism is one of the neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, which is characterized by impairment in social communication and cognition. And it, and it occurs in early stage of life. And uh, currently, one in 100 children has autism worldwide. Uh, for which uh, there is no effective treatment available to treat this uh, chronic uh, disorders. Uh, research have shown that uh, oxytocin is a potential therapeutic agent in reducing uh, these symptoms. Uh, it's also confirmed that centrally administered oxytocin can restore these symptoms in autistic uh, uh, mice models. Uh, similarly, uh, 107 clinical trial, uh, trials have been carried out for uh, the use of intranasal oxytocin, out of which uh, 29 uh, clinical trials have been registered for uh, intranasal oxytocin for adult autism, while 23 uh, clinical trials have been uh, carried out for children autism uh, after nose to brain delivery approach, which is uh, a non invasive and alternative approach to uh, uh, target the, the brain. Uh, and the nose to brain delivery has two major components the olfactory and trigeminal neuro pathway. And these are the only accessible and direct connection uh, of the body surfaces to the brain. But uh, intranasal free oxytocin have some limitation because it get absorbed to the systemic uh, circulation after uh, intranasal administration and can induce uh, centrally, uh, can induce peripheral uh, effects and it uh, further uh, indirectly induce central effect. So it can lead to some mixed and inconsistent result uh, in clinical research. And also due to the short half-life of uh, oxytocin and enzymatic degradation uh, in the nasal mucosa, limit the uh, effective nose to brain delivery of this uh, free intranasal oxytocin to target the central therapeutic action 
uh, without uh, uh, peripheral induced uh, central effect or without uh, uh, peripheral side effect. So my hypothesis is that encapsulation in nanoparticulate system will improve the delivery of oxytocin from nose to brain, which will result superior therapeutic efficacy as compared to free oxytocin. So the aim is to develop a, a quality nanoparticulate formulation for oxytocin delivery to the brain for treatment of neurological disorders such as autism. And the advantages of this system will uh, protect the uh, oxytocin for, uh, from the enzymatic degradation and it will facilitate the uptake of oxytocin to the brain with a controlled release uh, in the brain and with lower uh, side effects. So this is my overall plan, plan of work starting from formulation to in view studies. Uh, I formulated oxytocin nanoparticle uh, using um, biodegradable and biocompatible PLJ and pegylated PLJ nanopolymers um, and, and uh, stabilizers using a uh, nanoprecipitation method. And I optimize uh, this nanoparticulate system by using uh, design up experiment and different modalities were also used for the physicochemical characterization of uh, this uh, nanoparticle. So design up experiment actually is, is a systematic approach to study the interaction uh, among uh, different factors and also to predict the key factors and to optimize the responses such as uh, uh, size, PDI, and drug, drug loading efficiency, and it also uh, reduce the number of experiments. So I use this uh, three pictorial design, design to uh, optimize my uh, nanoparticle. Uh, I the, the, the developed nanoparticle were further characterized uh, by different modalities, and uh, we found as a, a cons consistent uh, minimum size around 100 nanometer using these three uh, modalities with lower PDI and uh, acceptable uh, zeta potential and high drug loading efficiency uh, sufficient for in view quantification. And the TIM images show a spherical, spherical morphologies of uh, these nanoparticles. Uh, further uh, drug release profile was uh, carried out and uh, which showed that the oxytocin from both polymeric nanoparticles have a sustained release profile uh, as compared to free oxytocin. Uh, to uh, see the diffusion rate of uh, these uh, uh, nanoparticles through nasal simulated uh, mucus, if we are going, to, we were going to administer this intranasally. So it's better to know about the translocation or the diffusion of these nanoparticles in the nasal simulated uh, mucus uh, using transwell inserts. So we found that pigulated nanoparticles uh, uh, significantly uh, higher diffusion rate as compared to the non-pigulated nanoparticle, uh, and we which we further use for in view uh, studies. Also, the uh, in vitro cell viability studies shown that uh, the nano or nanoparticle system has uh, uh, has a good uh, a safety profile and uh, it's not cytotoxic uh, upon exposure to primary nasal uh, epithelial cell line. Uh, further, to uh, quantify uh, oxytocin nanoparticle after uh, intranasal administration for in, in view studies, so we uh, synthesize carbon 14 level oxytocin by solid paste peptide synthesis, which is uh, uh, in which we use uh, solid paste peptide, peptide synthesis as a strategy for uh, synthesis of peptide uh, in which we use resin and uh, then couple individual amino acid uh, through carbonyl substitution reaction. And uh, finally, uh, we then uh, clue this peptide from the resin and until a new linear peptide is formed. And as oxytocin is a cyclic peptide, so we then cyclized uh, the, our oxytocin. And this is the overall uh, scheme of uh, synthesis of carbon-14 label oxytocin, uh, in which we use the carbon-14 label glycine uh, as a starting amino acid uh, uh, to, to form a, a linear peptide using standard FMAC solid paste peptide strategy. And then we cyclize this uh, uh, linear peptide to a cyclic peptide and purify it by solid phase extraction. Uh, we uh, characterize the linear peptide by LCMS, uh, in which we got 1009 uh, molecular mass 
And then the cyclized uh, oxytocin was confirmed again uh, by LCMS having uh, uh, the oxidized oxytocin, uh, the molecular uh, weight reduced to uh, 1007. Uh, further quantification was carried out by HPLC uh, and uh, the liquid scintillation counting was used for the radioactivity measurement, uh, which we got 74% uh, yield and uh, specific radioactivity activity of about 4.45 uh, uh, micro -curie per milligram, which is sufficient for in view dosing. In view by distribution study of carbon protein, oxytocin, and carbon protein level oxytocin nanoparticle was conducted in CD1 mice. Uh, the free oxytocin and carbon protein oxytocin nanoparticle was administered intranasally or intravenously. Uh, at terminal time points, all the uh, major organs, including uh, brain, were collected and processed for liquid scintillation counting. Uh, this is the overall organ biodistribution profile of intranasally administered free oxytocin and represented as percent injected dose per gram of tissue. While this one represents the overall organ biodistribution uh, of oxytocin nanoparticle at different time point after intranasal administration. Uh, if we compare uh, the uptake uh, of free oxytocin and intranasal oxytocin nanoparticle in major organs such as uh, blood, liver, nasal tissue, and brain, we can clearly see that the systemic absorption of free oxytocin uh, is uh, significantly uh, uh, higher than the nanoparticle, while the oxytocin nanoparticles have significantly higher uptake in the brain and the nasal tissue. For example, in blood, uh, the sum of the nanoparticle uh, absorbed into the systemic circulation at 10 uh, minutes, which is similar to free oxytocin, but uh, after 30 minutes, the nanoparticle has significantly lower uptake as compared to free oxytocin. And this may be due to the penetration of the nanoparticle to the olfactory and trigeminal neural pathways, and hence the systemic absorption uh, from the nasal tissues is reduced. Similar trend was also observed in liver in which the oxytocin nanoparticle has significantly lower uptake uh, as compared to free oxytocin. And it is due to the prolonged re uh, residence of these nanoparticle uh, in the nasal uh, tissue. Uh, similarly, if we see the brain, we found a constant and significantly higher uptake for oxytocin uh, nanoparticle as compared to free oxytocin. Mm -hmm. So overall, uh, the in view data show that oxytocin nanoparticles has reduced systemic exposure or absorption as compared to free oxytocin with higher penetration to the brain from direct uh, nose to brain pathway. We further com compare the uh, routes of uh, administration for intravenous free oxytocin and intranasal uh, oxytocin nanoparticle. Intranasal oxytocin nanoparticle has shown significantly higher uptake in nasal tissue and brain as compared to the intravenous route, which further confirm the uh, benefit of nose to brain pathway uh, or approach as compared to uh, systemic uh, administration. To further confirm the uh, translocation of uh, oxytocin nanoparticle inside the brain tissue, the brain was removed uh, after 10 and 60 minutes and dissected into different uh, brain section. Uh, here we found uh, up that oxytocin nanoparticle is penetrated to the olfactory bulb uh, at uh, a significantly higher level uh, as compared to free oxytocin after 10 minutes uh, of administration. Uh, after 60 minutes, uh, a similar trend was uh, observed for oxytocin nanoparticle with significantly higher uptake in the olfactory bulb. Uh, which show that oxytocin is constantly absorbing from the nasal mucosa due to its prolonged residence and further translocated toward the uh, cerebrum area, uh, which is cerebrum one. This show the, uh, a prolonged residence of this nanoparticle in the brain tissue in a sustained release and translocation to different uh, segments of the brain after intranasal administration of our developed uh, nanoparticulate system. Uh, to conclude, uh, a potential uh, nanoparticulate system for nose to brain delivery was developed with promising uh, physicochemical characteristics. Uh, similarly, in vitro studies have confirmed the safety and uh, instability of the formulation. The carbon 14 level oxytocin was successfully synthesized for in view quantification. 
Uh, while the in view biodistribution study confirmed an enhanced uh, brain uptake, brain oxytocin bioavailability uh, after intranasal administration. So we concluded on a successful oxytocin formulation as a potential uh, nano platform for nose to brain delivery of oxytocin. Uh, and future behavioral study of the oxytocin nanoparticle will further conclude on the central pharmacodynamic effect using behavioral mice models. Uh, I'm thankful to uh, my supervisor, Professor Khulud Al-Jamal and uh, Suki Bensel, Dr. Yanis, Dr. Dr. Julie, and all the Al-Jamal uh, group members. And I, I'm also thankful to the government of Pakistan for uh, a PhD scholarship. Thank you so much for listening, and I'm happy to take your question. Thank you so much.